Father, this is your word. These are your people who are called by your name. We humble ourselves and we pray and we seek our face and we turn from our wicked ways and we ask you to heal our land. We ask you to watch over our hearts. We ask you to protect our children, protect our homes, protect our families. God, thank you that you have not given us up. Your word says clearly, if it had not been God who was on our side, then all of our enemies would have swallowed us alive. Answer all the questions of our hearts by the power of your word. We ask these things now. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. Verse 1 of chapter 8 of the book of 2 Corinthians says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of of their liberality. Give me your attention, please. Yes, today we are going to learn about giving. Uh, It's one of those subjects that comes up in the scripture. I don't push it because it's not my church. It's God's church. However, every once in a while, just like anything else, you have to get to some place in the Bible where he talks about giving. So today, if you're new here, and you think, yeah, I figured I'm going to come to church and they're going to tell me about giving. Oh, you're right. (laughs) It's exactly what we're going to do today. Paul making his plea to the church in Corinth, he says, I want you to know what the grace of God did to the people of Macedonia. Macedonia was an area where the churches were known to be extremely poor. The people of Macedonia were impoverished. They had a, I say in jest, they had a bad housing crisis. They uh, had a couple of hurricanes and and then their electric, electric bills all went up, and the gas prices in Macedonia were like $5 a gallon. But yet, verse 2 says, In a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Verse 3, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, They were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift of the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. Give me your attention again here. I want you to understand something. Paul makes it clear here, and I don't think a lot of churches make it clear. There's a book um, called Grace Awakening. It was by um, Chuck Swindoll. I read this book years ago, and I'll never forget the picture he put in there. Before somebody comes and joins the cleaning crew on the church, before they've put a dollar in that box, before they've helped anybody fix their car, driven them to church, before anything that they've done, something happens in their heart. The exchange between their sin and God's righteousness occurs. Do you understand what I'm saying? Something happens. Salvation is not a process, it's the twinkling of an eye. It's the pop. Where somebody says, Christ, it's time. And that exchange happens. Something between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Something between the predestination that God knew from beforehand. Something happens. And before anything has been given, anything's been done, anything's been accomplished, that person is saved. In the Greek, so-so. So this is not whether you're saved or not. Listen, in case you all don't know, I don't make a salary here. I get a monthly housing allowance because if I didn't, I'd be broke. And then it would look really bad if the pastor of the church was broke. Put all the money you want or none of the money you want. It doesn't change how I feel about you. Put all the money you want or none of the money you want. It doesn't change how God feels about you. He welcomes you to heaven with the decision of your heart, not with the the dollar of finance, not with whose name is on your check. Do you understand that? Do you all understand that? Does everybody understand that? Just want to make sure. The church in Macedonia gave to the church in Corinth, which is really weird. 
Because the church in Corinth, that's like us taking up a collection for Calvary Fort Lauderdale. Hey guys, I know that they're struggling over there with their $8 million property and their $40 million, but they're doing a good work for the Lord over there. And four kids, a ministry, they live month to month. So let's take up a collection for four kids. That's what this was like. This wasn't the pastor saying, listen, folks, it's time for you to give to the church, so put your money in there. It wasn't that. He was saying, and what happened was there was a man who went from church to church bringing the messages. They didn't have email. They only had an email. You like that one? They didn't have an email. You know where you get on your knees? and Got it? So there's, a, there's people that went from church to church delivering messages. And this was a big conflict in the church. Was this one from Paul? Was this, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Titus. You'll see some of the things that he says here. That'll make it understand. The simplicity of the message sometimes is so small. It's, it's as simple as introdu- introductions. And yet as deep as the changing of one's destination from hell to heaven. It's, it's so amazing. The, the word of God is, is inexhaustible. The, the simplest of child could understand it, yet the biggest of scholar can't comprehend it. Verse 5. And not only as we hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything... Stop. Give me your attention. Let me explain to you what he says. These, if, if I was going to entitle this message, I could even call it the foundation of faith, the beginning of what you believe. Here is what Paul said to the believers. You know what? So as you don't think this is about me, because what happened in the church in Corinth is there was this big division. And people started saying, oh, we got a good thing here. But that Paul guy, he's only in it for the shkaros. He's only in it for the money. And it's understandable in our day and age when you see people on TV like Robert Tilton and they have the phone, the bank of phone people they're calling and call in your money now. Send us your $1,000 seed offering. Or what was that other dude's name that that was going to go to heaven unless somebody donated a million dollars? What was that dude's name? Oral Roberts. There was another guy that did that too just a couple of years ago. What was that? Who? Rod Parsley. Yes. These these quote-unquote men of God who find themselves telling the people, if you don't give your money, what? If I don't give my money, what? And the deafening silence is obvious, nothing. But he has to come up with something. He has to come up with a way to separate you from your money because as in the days of um, Tammy and Jim Baker, when they were building their kingdom, They had to have a a doghouse with an air conditioner. A fan was plenty. (laughs) Here, Paul says this. Before you give your money, y'all, you come here to church, I'm going to say the same thing to you that Paul said to the church in Corinth. Guys, here's what I want you to do before you put a dime in that box. You ready? Verse 7 says again, but as you abound in everything, first in faith, do you believe? Because let me tell you something, guys. If you don't believe in Christ, then putting your money in that box or giving it to anybody, Barack Obama, anybody, is only putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. The liberals that give their money for their causes are only doing it so they can help their conscience feel better about the foul things that they do. The foul things that they do. I had the strangest conversation last week with some woman who told me she didn't like Christians because they were Republicans. And I said, I'm not a Republican. Well, don't you believe in free... What was it she called it? Um, Oh, I was reducing the reproductive rights or something to that effect, the new catchphrase. And I said, well, I don't know... Um, I just think it's strange that some people who support things like the ASPCA 
who one, less than 1% of their money goes to actually taking care of dogs and the other 90 some odd percent goes to TV ads and such, you want to save the dogs, but you couldn't care less about the babies. And I find that strange. You consider life to be so precious and wonderful, unless it's a baby, of course. Well, do you know what happened? She told me when I was a kid, a woman tried to abort herself by putting a hanger. And, and she, she, and I said, well, let's see. Kill a baby, die of internal bleeding. I have no problem with that. You are sick. Yeah. I value, I value human life. Is that your phone again? Boy, I'm telling you, next time you do that, I will embarrass you so much worse than I'm embarrassing you now. That's my son. I can do that, guys. So first thing is believe. Believe. So unless you believe, do me a favor, guys. Don't come in here and put, a, don't put no money in the box. First, let me tell you about my Lord and Savior. Believe, receive the message, and after that, don't put your money in yet either. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to abound in speech. In speech. I want you to let God take a hold of your life long enough so that your speech starts to change. For me, it was supernatural. For some of us, it's not. The first thing that God did in me after he saved me was clean up my mouth. I had a foul mouth. I made truck drivers blush. And that was only my mother's side. <laughs> the weirdest thing happened. Every time I said something, I was like, I was afraid, it's, I was, something's going to happen. And I called my buddy up, who led me to the Lord, and I said, the strangest thing happens. Every time I say a cuss, I feel like God's mad at me. He said to me, that'll turn to love later. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, that's the fear of God. Right now, what happens when you first get saved, Ryan, is the fear of God comes upon you. And you're actually afraid to sin because you think God's mad at you. But over time, you're going to see that that's really the love of God in your heart that doesn't want you to grieve the Holy Spirit who now lives inside you. Amen. And I was like, what do you mean? Yeah, what happened was when you believed, the Holy Spirit came inside you. It's like, what do you mean? It's like you have a spirit inside you that is of God. And every time you do something now that grieves God, it grieves your own spirit. I was like, that's weird stuff, man. Now I understand it. Now I welcome it. And I look for the leading and the guiding of the Lord as we pray for Danielle to be led and guided by the Lord. Not to just choose a good path, but the best path. I have a brother that called me the other day from the gym. Received the Lord Jesus and he says, I don't know if I could hurt people anymore. And I said, Wow. What do I say to a guy that says that to me? I don't know if I want to hurt people anymore. This guy's been beating people up for years, and now all of a sudden he doesn't know if he can do that. And I said, you know what? You do what the Lord tells you to do. I said, but I will tell you this. Don't let some other Christian tell you you shouldn't do that. He said, what do you mean? The first thing that happens when you get saved is you get surrounded by all these people. You ever see those fish on the back of cars? Although I like the whole idea of a fish, I look very different than most fish. Would you agree? And I love the way you all look different than most fish. And to say all of a sudden you get saved and now you got to look like everybody else and do what everybody else does, I hate that whole idea. I like the individuality of my children. I love the fact that my daughter Ashlyn is a short little thing. I love the fact that my daughter Arlie is a big old thing. And I love the fact that my daughter Elena... <laughs> Married the second most wonderful man I've ever met. I love that. I love the individuality of the body of Christ. And when somebody calls and says, oh, you got saved and you do that MMA stuff, you know, God doesn't want you to hurt people. I say, well, maybe God wanted a missionary and he's chosen you in that industry. And you could be a bold witness for Christ within that industry, sharing the love of Christ. Amen. I never thought of that. I know. And it took a lot of thought and a lot of prayer for me to think about that. 
you know, as, as an MMA practitioner, as a, as a jiu-jitsu practitioner, that's, that's hard for me, you know. That's what I spend my days thinking about and doing and studying fights and watching people get hurt. Where as, as a young and you know, you, you look at somebody who has a black eye or gets blood and you're like, ah! Oh! Now it's like um, you're studying it. I think once you let the calling become the... Some people worship God and some people worship worship. Some people worship what it is that God blessed them with. And that's where the danger comes in. Do you understand? God gives you a job, and the first thing that you do sometimes with that job is stop going to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. And you go, hey, what happened, dude? You know, well, you know, I got this great job, and I know it's the Lord because I was praying about a job, and I got the job, but, but the job wants me to work on Sunday and Wednesday. And I go, that's not the Lord. And they go, oh, yeah, definitely. I'm making more money than I ever had. And this is a job I'm waiting for. No. God wouldn't give you a job that stops you from going to church. Why? Do you have to go to church to be a Christian? Well, you have to go to church to grow as a Christian. Amen. And a weak Christian is going to get devoured. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. So if in my pursuits in mixed martial arts or, or jujitsu, I forget that God put me there to be a witness, well, now I'm worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Amen. Now I'm worshiping the blessing rather than the blesser. And that's the danger as a Christian. So how did I get there? In faith, in speech, first God asks you to believe in him. Then the evidence is shown because your speech starts to change. But then it's knowledge. How do you gain knowledge? You see, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the... The next thing that happens is the knowledge of God. Now, remember what I said? You do all these things before you give the church a dime. Keep your money until then, okay? We don't need it that bad. You need it more than we do. So keep your money. First, believe. Then start to speak it. Then start to understand it. Knowledge. You all that first come to the Lord, start reading the Bible. You always say the same thing. I just don't understand what I'm reading. And I always say the same thing. Well, write down what you don't understand and bring it here. And myself, one of the other pastors, elders, and deacons will help you understand it. But know this, you're never going to understand everything. Anybody that's been coming to church long enough here knows I'll get to some things and I'll go, and I have no idea what that means. Maybe we'll find out in heaven. Maybe somebody will tell me someday. Let's move on. If you could understand everything that's in the Bible, then you should be God. Because if we're preaching a supernatural book, a book that is higher, greater, mightier, knows all, tells all, and I can understand the whole thing, you should worship me then. Thank God you don't. Thank God you shouldn't. Abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence. Diligence. That word diligence is to push despite circumstances. Push despite circumstances. Let me explain to you. The Lord Jesus put it this way in the Beatitudes. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let me explain to you the diligence of walking with Christ. Okay? For a brother or a sister involved in ministry, there's things that surround them, that pull them in a direction. I like to think about my brother Mursad. He gets flown all over different parts of the country. He fights. And then he comes back home. What happens in those journeys? Do you know how many women would surround themselves with a man that fights that good? I think he looks good. I, no, never mind. <laughs> but all, all seriousness, he's a good-looking young brother. And many things want to pull him in that direction. But you know why? He doesn't. Diligence. Diligence. When we're at the gym and we're surrounded by guys and every other word is a cuss word or every other word is a story about a sexual conquest or every other story, it takes diligence and strength. If you're a sister and you're around other sisters and they get involved in girl talk that is coarse, it's hard for you not to engage in it. Diligence will stop you. Now, how long will it take you to do all these things? I don't know. That's between you and God. But here's what I don't want. I don't want your money to go in the box until you accomplish these things. What? Are you a pastor? Don't you have rent? Yeah. You guys want to know what the rent costs? $13,000 a month. And we got a great deal. They wanted 40 
grand a month. We walked away from this building, I can't tell you, in three years, probably ten times. No thank you, no thank you, no thank you. We have 8,000 square feet. You know people come to this. Now, you all that come from a big church, you come here and you go, oh, this is cute, this is nice. Let me tell you what people who come from real churches, they walk in and they go, oh my God, where did you get this building? This is incredible. How many people are here? What? A hundred, maybe? A church of a hundred people has a building like this? Do you know what kind of place people who have churches twice the size of ours meet in? Beat up old storefronts, um, houses, high schools, movie theaters, cafeterias. God blessed us with this building. And it costs a lot of money to maintain it. And I'm telling you to keep your money until you get these things down. I don't want your money to go in a box. I'd rather not pay the rent than to think that I'm trying to hustle you out of your coin. I'd rather first you have the faith. I'd rather next you have the speech. Next you have the knowledge. Next you have the diligence. And ready? And lastly, and in your love for us. See that you are bound in this grace also. So, I remember being a new believer and the first couple of years... I wasn't the sunshiny, happy guy that stands before you now. I was a little bit hard-edged, maybe even rough around the edges a tad. And I, I was not a lover of people. I don't like people, generally speaking. I, don't, I'm, I become a people person because of the love of Christ. But you know what? I got my circle of friends. I got my wife and I got my kids. You know what? Just stay away from me. <laughs> but the craziest thing started to happen in my heart after a couple of years. At Fort Lauderdale, Pastor... Uh, Clay used to say, say hello to the person standing next to you. And I'd be like. <laughs> man, in two years, man, I'm like, hi, man. It's so good to see you again. How you doing, man? How are you? And my son would be like, it's me, Dad. Yeah, but how are is I don't know how that craziness happened. All of a sudden, I, the love of God started to abound in my heart and giving me a love for people, a care and a concern for people. Not just, hey, how's it going? But how are you doing? Not just forget about it. You got me? Then after you got all those things, then you can start putting money in the box. Okay? Next week we'll talk about percentages and all of that stuff and what the Bible says about this, that, and the other thing. We'll talk about that next week. Don't worry about that. Here's what I want you to do. First, believe. Then let the speech that comes out of your mouth acknowledge what's going on in your heart. Then get the knowledge by reading God's word. Then have diligence to fight against the sin. Then abound in love. Then that grace can start to flow from you. That grace. That word grace in the Greek is kairos, which means Something given to you, you had no deserving of. It was a gift that you didn't expect, you didn't deserve. That word, get, this is an amazing word, because this word for grace, it has so many meanings, and the way Paul uses it so amazingly, what's happened is, watch, you go into your pocket, you pull out a 20, you pull out a 50, you pull out a 5, you pull out a 1, and it's just money, it's just a dead president, right? But something (laughs) happens... Wow, I didn't expect last from that one. Something happens when you dedicate it to God. It becomes grace. What was foul and filthy, what the Bible actually says is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But yet something happens when it's dedicated to, when it's given up, when it's ordained for the sick, the children, the poor, the ministry. It becomes grace. Everything that's in that box is great. I love this story, guys. Um, I have a pastor from my old church named John Cinelli. And he tells this story that before he got saved, he would go into the church the Catholic church where he was, and he would steal things. Because the chalices and the, all this stuff that was made of gold, and he'd go there and he'd steal stuff and he'd take it and he'd sell it. 
And the church never knew he had the keys to the church or whatever. I don't know, something like that. But he said that every time that he would pass the center, if you guys have been, you, you, when you pass the crucifix that's on the wall, you got to kind of do the whole genuflect thing there. He said he would go there, he'd steal, he'd be leaving the church, and he'd leave. Man, you touch the things of God, that ain't just a golden chalice, man. That just ain't money in that box there. You take that. If you've ever been with me and we've been driving in a car and some um, homeless man, a, a bum, a hobo, whatever you want to call him, comes up to your car and asks you for money, I occasionally will grab a handful of coin or a buck or two. Or if you're ever at pumping gas and somebody, hey, can I have money for food? How do you say no sometimes? like... Your heart is just so broken, you know, the love of Christ. So what we'll do is we'll give them a $5 bill, a $10 bill. We'll put our hands on We'll pray that if they buy, and we'll pray, God, if, if this person buys drugs or anything but food, may it rot in his belly and he get bowel syndrome or something like that. And they go, hey! And I go, you take this grace. Be careful what you do with it. You just ask me for money for food. You go buy alcohol with it or drugs, I hope it poisons you. Take your money back. <laughs> Wise choice. That's grace, man. That ain't just money now. You understand the principle here. And watch what he does with this. Continuing on. Verse uh, 8 now. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Ooh. Testing the sincerity of love by the diligence of others. Really got Christ in your heart? For real? then that money that's in your pocket won't have such a stronghold on you anymore. You won't be in love with that money. What you will be in love with is giving it away and what it does to others in the blessing thereof. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Let me give you the picture here, Ken Graves style. Bear with me, if you will. You're walking down the street in Florida. Say down 441, somewhere in Boynton. And you come across a possum. And he ain't playing dead. But you'll find not only is he dead, but he is wriggling with life. And because you're a guy... You kick it. (laughs) Boom. And out of that dead carcass is a maggot. Not just a maggot, but thousands of maggots. Is there anything more repulsive in life than a maggot? And it's wriggling. They're all squiggly. I mean, I don't care how spirit-filled you are. You're not going to go, oh, I got to get him off the road. Nobody has a maggot collection. Oh, my little maggot. You, know, you don't stuff your pockets with them. My maggot. Is that disgusting? But the measurable distance between where you are and where that maggot is is understandable. It's a maggot. It's an animal. It breathes. It lives. The immeasurable distance from where Jesus Christ was, creator of all things, at the right hand of Father God, King of kings and Lord of lords, creating all things, knowing all things, the distance that he came from that position to a baby in the womb of a human woman. It's immeasurable. A whole lot further than the distance between you and that maggot. But yet he reckoned in his richness that something had to be done about your poverty. Imagine, you are King Maggot. And the only way that you can save those poor maggots is to become one of them and live amongst that rotten carcass boiling in the hot sun. Somebody, you understand what I'm saying? And this is what he did. Though he was rich, yet he became poor. That grace that he bestowed upon us is what makes us bestow the grace upon others. You guys have heard me say, 
If it wasn't for giving God what he's already given to me, believe me, I can drive a whole lot nicer car than I do. Again, verse uh, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You take that maggot home, you bring him to your house, and you feed him the finest in your refrigerator. You take the steak out and you leave it on a counter and you feed that maggot. That's what he did for us. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I'd have told you. John chapter 14, verse 1. The Bible says in Genesis 1 that in six days... God created the heaven and the earth, and the seventh day he rested. The Lord Jesus, God himself, said, I go to prepare a place for you. He's been gone 2,000 years. Somebody want to tell me how great heaven's going to be? I can't wait. Verse 10, and in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it so that there was a readiness to desire it, so there also must be a readiness out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. Give me your attention, please. He says, the church in Macedonia made a promise they were going to do something a year ago. He said it was great. It was a great promise. The Bible says in the book of, of Proverbs that he who boasts of giving and doesn't do so is like cloud and wind without rain. In, in, in an agricultural society, when you saw clouds on the horizon, you knew, yes, the fields were going to get watered, especially in a time of dryness. But if those clouds and wind came by and it's like no rain, that's somebody who boasts of giving and doesn't do it. He says, don't just talk about it. Don't just say it. Do it. Christ came and did it. Verse 13, For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, and their abundance also may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. He says, listen, I'm not telling you to give what you don't got. I'm just telling you to give what you promised God you were going to give. That's it. Remember, don't give to God because you want God to give to you. First believe, right? Then let your speech reflect it. Then let the knowledge be there. Understand all these things first. Let the love of God flow from you, then give. But don't find yourself being propelled, being pushed, being compelled to give because, don't worry, God's going to give back to you. Wrong reason to give. Wrong reason to give. He says, quoting, and he quotes the scriptures. I love that about Paul. Always quoting scripture. He says, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. He says, because some people... No matter how much money they have coming in, it seems like they're always broke. And yet some people who don't have nothing seem to never have a problem. It's no problem, no lack. How many of you lost something when the economy crashed? How many of you have lived a completely different lifestyle than you did? From Yeah, I think most of you all, if you were going to be honest about it. But yet you're here. But yet you're here. And here he talks about poverty. Let me explain to you what poverty is and isn't, okay? Poverty isn't having a smartphone. You have an iPhone, you're not poor. Let me make it clearer. If you have a phone at all, you're not poor. Don't talk about how impoverished you are and you have a 40-inch screen TV. Listen, we laugh because we don't want to cry. Because my own personal life, I found myself bemoaning to God how tough times were while I sat back pushing the controls, watching the next fight on TV. 
paying $49.99. I had to check myself. I, mean, is, I guess I'm not really near as, as... God, you're pretty good. Got a long way to go before I can call myself poor. And I think in America, we've become so spoiled with that. You go to um, my daughters, who have all, most of them have gone on. By the way, is Ashlyn's not in here. She's serving. Can I solicit some prayer? She came to me the other day, and she wants to go to Africa. We have a friend of ours that serves at an orphanage in Africa. But it's, it's Uganda. It's like white folks shouldn't go there much. You know what I'm talking about? And if I'm going to send her there, it's got to be the will of God. Because if I'm going to send my daughter in harm's way, I want it to be the Lord. So if I can ask you for prayer so that my daughter can serve with those that are really poor. Let me tell you, we did something, me and my wife did something about five years ago. This woman, you guys, some of you guys that have been in this church any while, Claudia Arango that came here with all the kids. We packed up a bunch of boxes and FedExed them to Africa. Cost a fortune, but let me tell you something. It was so worth it. You had to see the look. The toys that my kids threw out. And plus we sent them some things that ladies need. And it was a great blessing to them. And uh, to see them playing with my kids' throwaway toys and the smiles on their faces, you learn about poverty when you talk about it. So Ashton's praying about going there, and, and it's, it's a year commitment. We don't, I don't do that whole short-term mission thing. It, it's a minimum of a year commitment and probably a lifetime commitment. So please, if you would just pray for her when you see her, just lay your hands on pray that God would give her you know, the right understanding of this. Because you go there with the... Put it this way. It's better to be in Africa in danger of your life in God's will than here not in danger of life out of God's will. You know what I mean? Uh, verse 13, uh, no, we did 13, 16. But thanks, be, but thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus, for he did not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. Titus was the guy that was delivering and picking up the blessings, the grace. So you have to choose carefully who's doing that. And for our knowledge, only a few people count that money. I used to be the one that does it. Now it's Austin and Pastor Lee and Pastor Austin do it. They're the only ones. And then we count it all up, we put it on paper, and then we give it to Julia, who's the, who's the church bookkeeper. So it's not, that money is not money to us. As soon as it hits that box, it's grace. It's grace. And we carefully take care of it such. And here's the illustration he's making. He's telling the church in Corinth, listen, I know you're a big affluential church and you want to send some money in Macedonia, but the same way Macedonia sent the money to you, it's the same way. It's going to be Titus. So if somebody comes there and says they're from Paul, give me the money, we're going to bring it there. Don't fall for it. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish in your giving. You guys got it? Don't be foolish in your giving. Don't be cheated out of what God has blessed you with. Because the Bible says this, and I love this verse, and it's it's a weird application of the verse, but it fits. Don't take what is holy and give it to the dogs. Don't take what is holy and give it to the dogs. Um, The Bible also says this. A, a rich, a rich, a ruler. Paraphrase: A ruler who rules harshly over poor people is like a charging bear or a roaring lion. To give, to the, to take from the poor to give to the rich, is a great abomination in the Lord's eyes. You must be careful who you give your money to. When these people on TV, especially on the. Uh, the 700 clubs and the, and the Trinity Broadcasting Network, you have to be careful. You just don't know who's sincere on that channel and who's not. And I'm not going to say it's worthless and valueless, but you just got to be careful. How do you do that? This is, this is a great thing about living in the information age. Google it. See the pros and the cons. See if there's a real need. About two years ago, me and my family stopped giving to Compassion International. You guys know Compassion International. We had, at one point, we had seven or eight kids, you know, and we were giving every month, giving them. And then all of a sudden, a report came out. And they pay people in their organization. There's two people in their organization that make over a quarter million dollars a year. And I just couldn't do it no more. Hey, listen, I'm sure they're worth the money. Um, Bless his heart, Franklin Graham does a great work for the Lord. But the guy makes over a million dollars a year between the organizations that he works for. I can't support Samaritan's Purse anymore. I can't do it. Well, and I called them up and I said, listen, honestly, I can't give to you guys anymore. I've been giving to you guys for 10 years. I can't. How come? 
I just saw the guy's making $500,000 a year from this organization and another $500,000 a year from his father's organization. I can't give you guys money anymore. Oh, but you don't understand. He's the figurehead, and that equates to less than one quarter of percent of the money we have coming in. You still ain't getting my money. You can find ministries that really need the money. And if you need help doing that, we'll help you. Don't worry about it. Continuing, though. Verse 18. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in... I love this. You, you see this guy's name? The brother. Whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Do you know who that is? Nobody knows who that is. He is an unnamed man who is very known in all the churches as just being a good guy, a guy you can trust, a faithful guy. We sent him the brother. Now, some would suspect that the reason they didn't mention his name in there is because they didn't know who was going to get this letter and they didn't want to know. Because unlike in our day and age, guys, know this. Being a Christian now is pretty darn safe in America. Being a Christian then, you can get killed. Oh, you're one of those Christians. That, now, imagine, here, here, here's a guy on horseback or in a chariot, and he's riding across, and he goes across a, a, a province where they do a, a check or a toll. Where are you doing? Where are you going? Well, we came from uh, Macedonia, and we're going to Corinth. Really? And they start to check him, and they find this paper. Oh, picking up money, huh? You don't know if the centurions were going to rob him or whatnot. And they find out the guy's name. Well, well, we'll just put an APB out for this guy who, who we know now goes from church to church bringing money, supporting the church. To us, that sounds so foreign. Let me tell you, that's going on right now in China. That's going on. Forget about what's going on in Iran and Iraq. Continuing, verse 19. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself, and to show your ready mind, avoiding this, that anyone which blame us in this lavish gift, which is administered by us, providing honorable things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. The guy's honorable. Don't worry about it. This lavish gift... It's not about us. It's about the Lord. Again, Paul just uses so many words to describe things. Verse 22. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren inquired about, they are messengers of the churches. The glory of Christ, therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. Close your Bible. Last thought. Give me your attention, please. Remember what I just said. That whole last four or five verses we read was because these men were in danger. And it wasn't a Western Union, man. They had to walk around with a bag and collect the money and close up the bag and hide it in a knapsack and then hide the knapsack in the chariot or underneath the horse's um, thing, whatever it's called. What's it called? Saddle. And how do you know who's picking the money up and who's dropping it off and who's in danger of death? Please, if anything... Know how blessed that we are in this country. Know how blessed we are. We have a great country. We have a great God who has blessed this country abundantly. And for whatever reason, we consider ourselves... Listen, this is the hardest part. This is where we finish. To understand that you were born into this nation, into this country, not into some impoverished place, is only the grace of God. And with great power comes great responsibility. That's Spider-Man, by the way. (laughs) That wasn't scripture, right? So you have this awesome power. You also have this awesome responsibility. For to know and to think for your... Just think for a second. You could have been born somewhere in South America. You could have been born somewhere in Africa. You could have been born somewhere in Asia where the favor of God is not upon the land. Where you are born in... um, Some of you all were born in Haiti. And you came here. And you want to... Listen, you want to get up and tell testimony. Let me tell you how poor Haiti is. Let me tell you what death awaits you in Haiti. Let me tell you that 45 minutes away... What poverty exists. And to say to yourself, okay, God, you must really, really love me more than them. 
to have me born here and not there. And to have me born into the family I have and to have as much as I have here. No, he doesn't love you more. It's just grace. Well, what does that mean? I don't understand. There's no understanding of it. It's not like he prefers you over them. This is just the grace that's upon you. Well, because he must dislike the people that were born in an impoverished nation. No, he doesn't dislike them. Then why did he put me here? You're trying to understand why God loves you the way he does, and you're not going to. That's grace. That's grace. Why, God? Do you, you know how many times I have, after, especially after a sin, walked back and forth going, God, why did you choose me? And I just picture him up in heaven going, because I love you. <laughs> and he shakes his head at me and I go, I can't handle this. I don't want somebody to love me so much when I know I don't deserve to be loved so much. And isn't that the most... <laughs> you can't understand it. It's beyond comprehension of love. Why would he come and live in a, in a body of death? To make himself poor so that I may become rich. Does this sound a different message than you're hearing from most churches? Well, I got a better idea. Hand out the, the index cards, write names of family members on there, give $100, put it in a box, and we'll tape them on the walls for you. Sorry. Keep your money. First get saved. Then have the evidence in your mouth. Then understand the knowledge. Then abound in the love, then give your money. Until then, keep your money. Wow, you must have a lot of money in the bank. We got no money in the bank. When God meets our need every single month, praise God. Because I'd like to think we're doing God's work. And I want you to know we're doing God's work. And when we do things like an outreach picnic, we pray for people. The pastors get together. Pastors, elders, and deacons get together at least every two weeks. And we pray and we seek the face of God and ask him for wisdom and strength. And that money that we spend, believe me when I tell you, it ain't money to us anymore. It's grace. There is no waste of money happening. None. Is anybody here? Dustin, why don't you come up and play a song real quick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, here's where we close. But I just want to give anybody an offer here to come to the Lord. Just, you, you heard something today that's been insane. You heard something today that you never heard before. You heard something today that, and I just, and I don't care if everybody here knows the Lord. I don't care if nobody stands up. I don't care if nobody makes a decision. I don't care. But I want you to know if you bring your folks here, if you bring your peoples here, we're going to give them a chance at least to know the Lord. Okay? So, Dustin's going to play a song. I'm going to ask the Christians in the room to be praying. If somebody here doesn't know or is unsure if they know the Lord, that they can dedicate their lives to the Lord in the presence of many. Why in the presence of many? Well, not so many. Because he, the Lord Jesus, did it in the presence of many. For his love for us died naked and beaten, crushed on a cross. Please know this, you who don't understand God. Our Jesus did not go to the cross willingly. He went obediently. He said to his father, if there be any other way, not the cross. And the father said, no, I'm sorry, no other way. And he went, all right, I'm in. And all he asks you to do, instead of dying and getting beaten and all, He just says, all right, I'm in. Now, sometimes I say it's between you and God, and for whatever reason in my head right now, whether it's me or whether it's the Spirit leading me, I'm going to say to you, you here that want to accept Christ, after Dustin plays a song to soften your heart, to give the Christians a chance to pray, to give you a chance to make a smart decision, stand to your feet in the presence of 50, 60 people and say, okay, I'm going to live for Christ. Christians be praying. Pastor, please play a song. I'm going to sit here and pray myself. Austin, could you do me a favor? Just drop the lights down a little bit.
stood before creation Eternity in your hands You spoke the world into motion My soul now to stay Carried the cross of my shame My sin weighed upon your shoulders My soul now to stay So what could I say? What could I do? To offer this heart, oh God Completely you So I walk away Life to declare your promise, my soul now to steal. So, what could I say? What could I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So what could I say? What could I do? and said any of you who are thirsty come to me so many of the people they feel and look so full and there's a hole in their heart just the size of God and they've jammed money in it and they've jammed alcohol in it, and they've jammed drugs in it, and they've jammed sex in it, and they've jammed everything they can to fill this hole, but it's the proverbial square peg trying to be stuck in a round hole. There is one thing that will satisfy 
the longing desire of your heart. You who will soon be my brother and sister in the Lord, if you have been doing this for too long and found yourself on that rat race, in, on that wheel, that hamster wheel, and you want to get off and to begin a relationship first to believe, just to believe, not to become a Republican, not to become, believe in evolution, not to anything that you think will stop you. Let nothing stop you today from just saying yes to God. And let's worry about all the other stuff later. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, redeeming your life, stand to your feet. God bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you, Mama. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Is there anybody else who just wants to stand up and just in the presence of a few brothers and sisters, just say, I want to accept Christ and I don't care who knows it. I want to make sure it's right. I want to make sure that this time it's for real. God bless you, brother. Just another 10 seconds and then we're going to say this prayer. Is anybody else who wants to just receive the Spirit and let, let Him do the work. Congratulations. Good job, guys. Yes. Okay. You that are standing either in your seats or in your heart standing, but yet still in your seat, that's fine. Say this prayer more than in your mouth, but in your heart. And what I'm doing is I'm going to give you the words, but it's got to be your prayer. It's got to be. Because you can't live for me and get anywhere. But you can live for Christ and soar to the heights of heaven you never, ever imagined. Say out loud, according to Scripture, Dear God, I open my heart and I invite you inside. Be my friend. Be my God. Be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I believe that you rose from the dead. I want to be called Christian. Amen. Amen. Give him a hand. Any of you all that stood up, if there is a, a need now that the hands and the feet of Christ can fill, the need that the Spirit just filled can only be filled by the Spirit. If there's a need that the hands and the feet, which is us, can fill, please see one of us. You'll have, you'll have um, pastors, elders, and deacons and their wives up at the stage here. Please come and see us. If it's just between you and God, it's, it's just between you and God. But if you need a Bible, if you need a study guide, if you need prayer, because whatever God has done in your life to get you to this place, we know what it's like. Please know, I was where you are not too many years ago. And if you now regret not standing, you can also do that same thing right here with us. Say, hey, listen, I should have said that prayer and I didn't. Can you lead me in that prayer again? We can do that. Whatever it is, let us be the hands and feet of Christ. Let us bestow to you the grace that was given to us. Please let us give it out. Because it's not, it's like having a million dollars in the bank. Unless you spend it, it don't mean nothing. I got all this grace upon my life. I got to give it out. Okay? Close us in song. And God bless you guys. I love you. Thank you so much.
Would you guys stand with us? Austin, Andrew should have had the words to the stand back in there. So what can I see? What can I do? Offer this tired old God Completed you So what can I say And what can I do To offer church to sing this part out with us so I'll stand so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrendered all I am so I will stand, so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. 